Um, we ended up talking about this example, right? So the point was um, trying to see, um, or let's say argue that optimality depends on the loss function. So we looked at this example of uh, estimating uh, the, in, like the expected, or the rate, let's say the rate of a Poisson process. And so we can model this as um, uh, an example where we observe these inter-arrival times, which are IID from exponential distribution. This is a property of the Poisson process. And then you can um, like model this in the decision theoretic framework. Um, I'm hiding some of the details as we go along. You can see the parts, like if you want, you can write down all the formal sort of pieces. What is the, uh, the distribution? The, the parametric common distribution, what is the like the so it's always the term for the same thing actually takes on um, the positive reals. And then uh, the distribution, uh, we are sort of uh, using this density as a surrogate, this is the joint density, and we factor it, we factorize this um, over the marginal, so it's the product the marginal distributions, and we wrote this down. And I made a comment here about the likelihood. Let's see how many people got their comment. So what is the likelihood or the likelihood function? Let's see if you guys read. What is that? Okay. Uh, what was your name again? Marion. Marion, okay. And my second Sorry? So, so what, what, are you answering the question? Yeah. So what is the likelihood? And my sigma expect. And my sigma. Not sure what that means. Uh, sigma expect. We don't have a sigma here. Yeah. Mean this? Uh, oh, the mean. Uh, so the mean of you're saying this is the likelihood. Uh, so so I'm not talking about the maximum likelihood, just the likelihood itself. So the likelihood, yeah. Let me see what. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is close. Yeah. So it, it the likelihood is a function from the parameter space to the reals, and um, oftentimes the value is not the same probably, but it's just the density, right? The density of observing that. Uh, you can think of it as like infinitesimal probability. But yeah, so the observer, so this, this guy, doing probability theory, this is a density, right? So sort of it's a probability of learning x. That's exactly the, this time the x is the probability theory, you can get like an infinitesimal interval around it. But in statistics, you observe x, so there's no reason why you want to like look at this as a function of x anymore. So you fix x as the observed as the observed value here in the entire sequence. And then uh, you can have a parameter when you look at this as a function of parameter. So that, that function that maps the parameter to this value of the density, that's called the likelihood. Okay, it's important, it's an important distinction. So if like one take home message let's say from this course is if you, you learn what likelihood function is. Okay. And a lot of the things that we carry like in this course of boils down to the properties of the likelihood function. Okay, so is that clear? Yeah. Um, so, so like, yeah. That's a good question. So if you rephrase the question, so the density is, if you, if you have seen measure theory, uh, the density is not um, uniquely specified. So it's something that you take the integral off over a set and gives you the probability. And because of the, the way that the big integrals are defined, if I manipulate the density at a set of points, points um, it's not going to affect uh, my um, uh, it's not going to affect my um, probably the distribution, right? So, um, so, for example, 
we all seen this is the Gaussian distribution, let's say in, in, in the real. So e to the negative x squared over two. Uh, so we call it p of x. Um, so that's the functional form, right? It's like continuous, nice. Um, I can redefine it at, at a finite number point. Let's say I can redefine it at this point. So I, I just define it to be this everywhere except zero. And at zero, I define it to be phi. So let's say like 0.5, like somewhere here. So I redefine it at a point. Um, is this going to change the distribution if I change the density at this point? No, this is also a valid density for the Gaussian distribution. It might seem strange to you guys, but as long as you care about the density as far as it just gives you the probability. So if I integrate this uh, new guys over any set, according to the Lebesgue measure, this has the same, it's called this P prime, is the same as P of X dx, or P of X is the original one. Okay. So now the question is that if I can redefine it at any point, arbitrarily, what does it mean to, to uh, talk about the light here, right? Um, that's the question, okay. So let's see if anyone can answer, yeah. We choose the continuous represent. Um, okay, so, uh, That would be interesting. So, so how many people know what Lebesgue's differentiation? So you're talking about Lebesgue differentiations here. Yeah. So, okay, there is a continuous representative of that. So, but why do I have to care about the continuous representative? That's the question. Does it have any specific feature? Okay. Um, yeah. I was going to say that you're only allowed to do that at counterably many, counterably infinite many points, right? And so, like, everywhere else, the distribution has to be the same. You're right. And so, on any, if you take any subset, right, like, sort of the not counterably infinite many points, that way, counterably infinite many points, I guess, are not. Okay. Right, so you're defending your own point, right? He's trying to answer what you're saying. Okay. Uh, yeah? Well, like uh, for the maximum likelihood estimator, like if you uh, say you can the density, taking the point and uh, affected it at the maximum density, if you just take the supreme one, you would still end up with the same density, right? If, if what? Uh, if I. Like it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you affected the density at the maximum point, as long as you just take the supreme one. So we take the maximum over the parameter. So I'm gonna fix the uh, x, right? And um, then I'm gonna vary lambda, yeah. right? So the, the maximum over lambda, so that entire function would be, so it, it gets a little bit to the point, but uh, taking the supremum, I'm not um, like modifying the function at a single lambda, right? The, so you're taking the supreme over lambda. So if you modify this function over the like, point in lambda, that would be your point. You're talking about like modifying it as new x for all lambda. Okay. It's a very interesting point. So uh, in the years that I've taught this course, never asked this and I never thought about it. So I want to see your points, points of view while I think about how to answer that question. <laughs> Any, anyone else wants to speak? So it's an interesting point. Supremum works like, so the supremum of this function doesn't change 
right? If I if I manipulate like modify the single point, but um, I'm not taking the supreme over of x. I'm just modifying it at x, and then later I take it. Like I'm not plotting it as a function of lambda here, for example. Right? Okay. Yeah. Well, I think the way you have to do that sounds good, but still, like as long as it's a limiting process, if you just manipulate the point, it's it's going to capture. So everything here, so if I, if I like take the limit, it doesn't matter if I minute. So the limit differentiation here and here also works. So still, this is a valid density. I think it, this integral gives me the probability. Right, correctly gives you the probability all the way, except at that single. Like you can't collapse it to the single point. Yeah. That would give you. So you're saying okay. So you're saying the Lebesgue differentiation here and gives you um, the correct value there. Okay. So you're saying. So, so the vague differential theorem gives you a single version of the density. Is that so? So let's say. Um, so the peak differentiation is like, like at the a little bit more high-powered version of the like, um, like the fundamental theorem calculus. Okay, so um, so for example, if I have this function, so I can manipulate at a different point, but but then if I take the um, so if it's a continuous function, you're saying I'm going to get back this when I take the different derivative. But if I manipulate at a point, I'm not going to get all the possible because this is this has a unique specific derivative. Right? Is that the derivative can't be like multiple things at any given point, right? So I'm 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 free to manipulate this, but then I'm going to get uh, only one. Version that, like, what the Lebesgue differentiation theorem says is is I'm gonna get. Yeah, the reason I'm gonna this is okay, but like the Lebesgue the issue with the Lebesgue differentiation theorem is that this is like holds almost everywhere with respect to the Lebesgue measure, so it's not gonna hold at all the points. So what 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 I'm not sure if there's a continuous version. So what what this is, um, you can you can check Lebesgue's differentiation theorem. So what what Lebesgue sort of shows is um, this is going to be equal to this almost everywhere, whatever measure. So which is um, okay, that's a different version of the theorem which I have to check. There what? If f is continued, so that that part is like yeah. So if if two functions are equal almost everywhere, right, and then one of them is continuous, then they have to be equal, right? Is that so? You're saying if it's small f, okay, okay, I, I'll check this. Um, the, the the version that I have in mind is like. Again, up to, it. but but that's 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 a good point. Yeah. When you have continuous what? Small right. Small So if it's continuous, you're saying it's going to be. Um, Okay, it, it might be, 
Okay, let, let me get back to whether this is going to be the solution or not. But even if the, the, like, the density is not continuous, so this works for densities that are like, let's say I have a discontinuity. Is that your argument is going to like the density for that discontinuity? Is it going to fail? So you say, right, this is, this is fine. So this is, let's say, one way of doing it. So I'm going to give you my own like uh, statistical sort of thinking, um, but we can, we can, like you guys can worry about later. So what you can do, at least as far as like, so this is like Christian says that you can manipulate it by a set of measure zero before you start to see your data. And let you do it on an accountable set, not once you see your data. So once you see your data, I'm not going to allow you to manipulate it there. So that's like information that you bring. And then you're also manipulating it over the entire Set of parameters. You're not manipulating just one, right? It's a parametric family, and you're saying I'm gonna go and alter all of them across all lambda. So this is a little problematic. I'm, I'm, uh, this is not part of the classical probability because you have an uncountable set of measures, and you're saying I'm gonna manipulate them all uh, at once at this point. So as long as at least you manipulate them before you see your data, um, then this should work. Because it's all we do when you're not going to get the same set of points. So, whatever points you pick, your observation is going to be. But um, is there a better way of defining the likelihood? So, let's say the likelihood is something like that. It works uh, before, like, as long as you set this down before, set up your density before you see the data, then there might be better ways of discussing. Yeah. Zero, yeah, yeah. Or you could like uh, work out better ways of if you want to be really measured here, do nothing sort of is sort of set down usually. Um, so there's no like perfect density. Um, but whether I mean, you want to work with those densities or not. I'm not sure if there's anything like uh, consequential, statistically consequential coming out of this argument, but like, rather than a thought experiment, but um, it's a good point. If you want to be formal about it, if we have densities, there is this ambiguity in density. So what, what are we talking about? Um, I have to go back and check whether there is a better way of defining the life. Um, we actually define it as like the, I, I think the Radon Euclidean derivative. So. So it could be that the likelihood is also like defined up to a set of um, measures. Ago. So we can check, but for, for the most part, I guess this discussion should like cement the idea of what is a likelihood. Okay. So hopefully you remember what the likelihood is and, and the sort of difficulty, potential difficulty. But all these discussions are interesting, okay? Um, good, everyone, happy with the likelihood. So far, um, okay. So what we do now is we um, um, we, we look at, for example, the max. So we, we came up with some estimator uh, using sort of an unbiased estimation of the mean of x one. Um, what we can uh, do also is do maximum likelihood. So one way of doing this, so intuitively, what this is, is as was mentioned, it's like uh, what is the probability of observing this particular x sort of um, for different values of parameter under different models that we have? So we evaluate the probability under different models and pick the model that maximizes this probability. That's the maximum like. But again, because the density data position is like a little bit uh, murky, if things are uh, uh, continuous, but the, that, that's the intuition. We pick the model under which the current observation has the most uh, likelihood. So um, if you take the maximum likelihood, so you have to take the derivative of this to lambda, and it turns out that the energy is just uh, one over x bar. So, um, so I asked you guys to, did you guys, any one of you try to do the rest for yourself? So you could do like the MSE, for example, compare the MSE. Uh, with another essay. So the, the idea was to, uh, this is not uh, 
on y. So we can try to correct for the bytes. Um, the way I'm going to do it is uh, first to see that it's on y, um, it's biased. Usually, when you have, um, so I have to take this uh, lambda hat. And this is going to give me something like that. And it's going to come out. Uh, I get one over S. Um, and if expectation would go inside, I, get, I, I would get one over expectation of S, then I would be happy. But because it's a nonlinear function, uh, this is not going to be equal generally, um, as we'll see uh, later, that this is not going to be equal to. Uh, and uh, over expectation of s, which would be what I want, this would be so because it's not equal to that. Um, it turns out that there's a one over s has this inverse gamma solution, and then we go do the integration or do the likelihood. So, sorry, the Wikipedia basically. So this gives you that the um, expectation of this turns out to be uh, lambda over n minus one, not n. So you get n over n minus one times lambda. Right, um, and because I want to estimate lambda, that there, was, there will be a bias uh, for lambda. So it'll be like n minus n minus one lambda minus lambda, which is um, non zero, right? Um, not I think it'll be zero, except for n equal one, by one. Not, not for any limit. Okay, so what we can do is a simple modification. I can just, um, because that's the, um, just um, differ by, by, by a factor of what I want, I just need to multiply by uh, the inverse of that factor. So I multiply my estimator by n, n minus one uh, divided by n times that, that. Right, so it's easy to see that now if I, um, if I have uh, this lambda tilde, which is n minus, sorry, n by n by, um, the other way, n minus one by n times lambda hat. This would be n minus one n expectation lambda hat. This would be uh, n over n minus one lambda. So I guess, um, okay. It's very clear because it's a constant factor that com comes out of the expectation and just cancels it out. Okay, so that's how I can make it unbiased. This way. So this was rather easy in this case. Okay, the enemy is unbiased, biased, but it's easy to correct for the bias. Now let's say I care about the quadratic loss, I care about the NSE, um, and I can go and calculate the NSE. And we know that the NSE is by squared plus variance. Um, and that would be sort of easy to um, at least I, I don't care about the exact value. I say I want to compare them. Uh, I want to compare the uh, NSEs, and, and the result is that um, the NSE of uh, this unbiased estimator is, is less than the NSE of uh, the MLB. And the reason to see it is um, this is going to have a positive bias. This has zero bias. So in terms of the bias, this one is. So the bias is square turning smaller. And also the variance of this. Is thinking is smaller than the variance of the enemy. So if that's the case, then because both terms in the NSC are smaller than should be. So why is this is true? Yeah, because when I take the uh, the variance, basically variance of lambda tilde would be the factor comes out, uh, and the factor is uh, n minus one over n squared. And the variance of lambda hat, so this is less than one. And uh, so we that's a variance of that. So we, we didn't need to calculate the MSD, you can use the bias variance the composition to argue. So your bias is better, your variance is better. So overall, you're better. Then this is an example where, where correcting for the bias also helps the variance. Um, and so the MLE is admissible for the quadratic loss. This is another example where. Um, the MLE is not admissible. Everyone remembers what, what this means. So what does this mean? Yeah. Every point lambda is better than lambda. So for every parameter lambda, lambda is better than Yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is the risk. And every value of the parameter, every lambda, 
the race gotcha is dependent. If you didn't need this strong statement, you just needed at least one point, and at the other point, that's not important. Um, as you can see, this is an example where as n grows to infinity, there's not much difference. So at the smaller samples, there is like a significant difference in the tree, and this tree that's in uh, the factor of two pairs, which is perhaps considerable. Uh, okay, uh, so far so good. Any questions? So what I wanted to argue here is that um, this is all fine. Um, but um, let's say I, I, I didn't care much about the quadratic loss. Uh, one reason you, you might not care about quadratic loss because the parameter is non zero, right? The quadratic loss would be sort of non symmetric because it's going to also penalize things that are true negative, but um, it's like a little bit. Uh, it's okay. It's a okay loss, but but let's say I, I could I construct a loss specifically for non-negative parameters, and one particular loss would be this kind of weird-looking uh, loss function, which I'm plotting here, where this is one of the arguments, which is not symmetric. So, um, fixing uh, maybe a, um, but this is sometimes like referred to as Pythagoras' theta distance. Uh, turns out to be an example of a Bregman, uh, Bregman divergence. Uh, these are kind of loss functions that you can create out of any convex function. We can come back to convex functions later. Uh, but if you have a convex function, um, if you look at phi, uh, R, if I look at this, is basically the remainder of the first order Taylor expansion. So if I expand phi of x from uh, point y, this is the first term. This is the, like the constant term minus the derivative times x minus y plus second derivative and so on. This is minus this part is minus the first order Taylor expansion. So the difference between the function and its Taylor expansion, uh, whatever it remains, is, is, is called fragment error. If you do it for negative log x, turns out to be negative x, you get this loss. You can create interesting loss functions this way. Uh, it's not going to be symmetric. But we'll say things should be symmetric. Uh, and it turns out to be an interesting loss here. So here it's going to uh, penalize a lot of things that are near zero, for example, and under penalize things that are big. So this, this is going to uh, penalize underestimation. So let's say if you care about more about underestimation, you don't care too much if you overshoot the true the side one. But if you underestimate, you want to penalize this is this might be good. Um, and uh, as you can see, this is shrinking for the smaller values. Um, and it might not be surprising that under this loss that uh, this is going to be more the one that shrinks a little bit and bias one. It turns out under this loss it's going to have a strictly bigger loss than the other one. Yes. We always actually uh, depends on what you mean by calculate. I'm always interested in MSC if it's not quadratic loss. Uh, so the MSC is the risk associated with quadratic loss. That's the MSC. Because oh, okay. the expectation of the loss when the loss is quadratic, yeah. that's what I'm referring to as the MSC. Otherwise, we just care about the risk. Yeah, so right. yeah, yeah. You can say risk in general, right? right? And this is. R risk under quadratic loss, you can just say R of lambda, lambda tilde, maybe. That would have been more, let's say R1 under this loss, which is a quadratic loss. This would be like that under the other loss for the order of flips. So it all depends on which. So under this, MLE makes the other one inefficient. Okay. So, uh, Whatever you want to take from this, it's your uh, opinion. Whether like all, all like is uh, maybe there's no truth, like everything is relative. It's a like philosophical question, and leave it there. But once you pin down the loss, then um, 
if you see, even if you pin them down the last layer, the answer is still not quite uh, sure, but you can, you can do more certainty. Um, so I just remind you that there is this uh, issue of optimality if you are not sure what your loss should be. Not sure. So I'm, I'm saying this is oh, no, we change our last functions to a different yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh yeah, then you need another decision tree on top of decision tree to decide which loss. I don't know to be honest. So quadratic loss is um, what uh, people use for simplicity, right? And you can manipulate it. There are a lot of good properties. Um, ultimately, just it's it's one of the questions like um, what should like how should I evaluate, right? So it depends on what you want to do. But as I mentioned, if you if you for example care about symmetry, it doesn't matter. Um, you could choose one of these symmetric losses. So there could be like quadratic loss, a one loss. They all have like certain features. Um, but if, if um, you want, for example, there's a, like a sequence, like there's a line of work in the statistics, uh, like maybe a few decades ago, the people um, try to go towards robust estimators. There you choose a different loss. So for example, uh, you want to penalize uh, like High, 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 a lot of, um, so, so there's like a Hoover loss. So let's, let's not go there, but um, you, would, you would change the quadratic loss outside the region to look linearly. Right? Quadratic loss penalizing too much, maybe. And, and then good properties happen. So you can change your loss depending on the problem that you're trying to solve. And, and then see, or, or if you care about theory, some losses might have like lead to better. Like, or not better, but better again, like a loaded word, to different properties for the estimator. Right? So, a certain loss might encourage robustness. Right? So, another loss might encourage something else. Um, the, um, yeah, I, I don't have a, like a definite answer. It's one of those questions that is like outside the scope of the decision tree. Okay, any other questions? Sometimes it's not up to you. It's like the loss is given by the problem, like in game theory, for example. Like if you're playing some game chance, the rules are set, so it's, it's your payoff is like, um, clear um, up front. So here we're playing the game ourselves, so we're setting the rules ourselves. But, yeah, so I guess I'm gonna assign a homework problem to go through showing that, um, uh, let me show this, you can show it yourself. And uh, let's move on to some, the next topic. I spent too much time on that. Any, any questions? If we can, we can stop there if you want. So we, we already talked a lot about the like setting of decision theory. You have some um, feel for, what decision theory is about, it gives you a way to evaluate estimators. Um, we've seen like unbiasedness, bias variance and composition, uh, at the severity. We're going to like change gear a little bit, talk about a different topic, um, which is going to be related. Uh, but this is um, like a detour, and then we're going to come back uh, to some of the other ideas that we discussed how to deal with the fact that the risk is not uh, a single number. So this is the um, sufficiency idea, uh, really old idea in statistics. And the idea is um, some part of your data might be relevant to the task of estimation or inference, some part might not. And you might be able to safely discard those parts, um, let's say even before you decide a loss or something like that. Um, so, um, Nothing in the like, decision theory framework changes. If you, if you discard those parts later, you can decide, I, I want to change my loss. You can still use uh, the level of part that you kept without losing the information. So basically, this is an idea of compression, okay, statistical compression. How can we compress um, our observation or data um, without losing 
relevant part. So relevant for statisticians is relevant to estimating the parameters or for the decision in this case we want to make. Um, so the, the, the idea is that um, there's this nice notion of sufficiency. There is some part of the data that, that's sufficient. And uh, not only it allows you to compress data, which, which helps computation and storage, efficient computation, efficient storage. Uh, in the early days of statistics, that mattered a lot. Nowadays, like these two inserts, like exploding, quoting, but compression matter, still matters, but not that much. Um, and then the irrelevant part, uh, the interesting part is that um, under some assumptions, if you keep the irrelevant parts, your risk can actually increase. So if you throw them out, you gain both from like a computational and storage perspective and also a statistical regain. Uh, so this is like uh, we get uh, everything. So sort of. Uh, so let's see what this idea is. Um, so this is the formal definition. So we have a probability model, which is a family of probability distribution parameters like some theta. If you recall, that's one of the ingredients of the theory framework. And then these are parameters. Uh, the parameter model, like or these are parameters. Uh, this is a parameter model for x. At each point, the distribution for x. So x is distributed like. Um, data. Um, so a statistic is um, so a statistic formally is a function of your observation. That's what we call a statistic. Okay. So any function of your uh, observations uh, alone is, is called a statistic. Okay. When they say a statistic means just a function of the So a statistic p, um, which is also I'm going to write a, as a function of x as well, and then just using the same notation with a little w. This is sufficient for this family p, or for theta, or for x, you can call it any of these things, if, if the conditional distribution of x within p does not depend on theta. Okay, that's the definition. So if I go and condition x uh, on this sufficient statistic or this statistic, uh, if the distribution does not depend on theta, the unknown parameter, then you say that p is sufficient for the family or for the parameter or for the x. Okay. Like this is this is better. So for, for p or for p. Um, formally, what this means is something like that. So if I take uh, any event, um, the probability under k that x belongs to a given the p is equal to p, this is something which does not depend on theta uh, for any p and any a. No matter what the condition here, and no matter what event I uh, with the this side is on a which does not depend on theta. And, and here again, to remind you, this means that x is distributed by p theta. Okay, so the distribution of x itself depends on theta. Um, the distribution of t is going to also depend on theta, uh, but the conditional distribution of x given t, we hope that doesn't depend on theta. Okay. Um, so this part is like a basically a technical uh, statement. We want this to be a Markov kernel. Uh, Markov kernel. What is Markov kernel? Is just something like this. Um, this the technical to say that like, there is some sort of major kinetic sort of issues. Of uh, trying to make this a valid probability distribution. So, you want this to be a, the, the way you define the conditional distribution. You want, you can define it, but it's going to be defined off the sets of measure zero. And you want to align all the sets of measure zero so that uh, for any given t, this whole thing is a probability measure. So, fix t, this is a probability measure in this argument. Fix a, this is going to be like a measure of a function that's in part of k. Sometimes you write it like q. Uh, ta. Uh, it, it's, it's a function in this argument, it's a measure in the other way. Okay. Uh, so you can think of them as transition probabilities in Markov chains. If I want to say t, what is the chance that they land in the next step in event a? Why it's called one. You know, it doesn't matter that much for us. It's just the, the main statistical part is that this part is not dependent on theta. Okay? Well, we'll see an example. That's the main point. So if I give you a statistic, once you conditional your observation on, on this statistic, 
the conditional distribution no longer depends on uh, theta, then that statistic is sufficient. Um, what it means is that um, I can, so T will have a distribution. I don't know what we should call it. Let's say maybe, um, I don't know, P tilde, um, yeah, P tilde uh, of theta. Um, X has an original distribution of P theta. Um, and then X given T is distributed like this Q. Um, let's call it T. Uh, this doesn't depend on theta. Because it doesn't depend on theta ahead of the time you know, because you set up the model, you don't know the parameter, but you know the entire model. And then because this part does not depend on theta, um, you, can, you can compute this. Okay, so you know this ahead of the time. So what happens is that I'm going to discard everything except this. So I'm going to keep T. I'm going to discard X. X loses some information because we'll see more. Uh, anyway, you form a function, you lose information. That's like your compression mechanism. So T loses some information relative to X. We're going to keep T. Uh, what you can do later is if you want to re recover X or identically or statistically identical copy, you can always generate X not the original X, but something that has the same distribution as your original X. That's the idea of sufficiency. So how can I, let's say I know this Q and I have um, my original T, right? So I have the data, I form the sufficient statistic, I keep this, I throw away my data. Someone later asks me to recreate the observations. They want the observation, the full observation. How can I create an observation that's statistically equivalent? Um, is the question clear? Can we use we use T to recover an observation statistically equivalent? To x. So if I know the parameter, I can I can create one because I know the distribution. I'm going to just sample from that distribution. But I don't know t. Sorry, I don't know theta. I know t. Can I recreate x without knowing theta? Um, not marginalized over t because I know t, right? I I, I don't want to sample t, right? Uh, or marginalized over okay, marginalized over t. Um, Okay, that, that, that you're okay. Uh, it, it's, it's hard because marginalizing over T. Um, okay, marginalizing over T, then what? The what then? Yeah, sorry, it, it's okay. So, yeah, so there is like. Right, so a, can you say it again? P. Uh, can you say it again? X given T and then what is the probability of T? Okay. Yeah. Over. Something like that. What would give us? What would this give us? Does it do us? So you're saying this is going to give us P of X. Sort of. Right, this is a little bit more than what I ask. I, I don't want to recover the entire distribution. I just want to like a sample, right? So how can I, yeah. Great, okay, that's, that's the point, All right? So that's easier. So this is, um, this is the conditional distribution of X given T, right? If I sample from the, I know T, if I sample from this distribution using the value of T that I know, then I have generated like a pair of like X prime and T. This has the same distribution as original X and T. I don't care about the T part, just the X. X, X these two would be identical. See the point? It's just um, the, the, the fact that I can generate uh, from this distribution without knowing theta is that where the sufficiency sort of comes in. Right? Sufficiency allows you to simulate your original data without knowing the underlying distribution, just knowing where the T. So the marginalization is similar idea, but we'll see like, um, it's gonna be tricky to write on the joint distribution X and T because they're functionally dependent. So does that make sense? So that's what, what, what I'm trying to say here. So 
uh, we can simulate x by an external source of randomness. Once we know the sufficient statistics, so we don't we no longer need it. As far as the statistics is concerned, we can always recreate. We don't need to recreate, but we can always recreate a data which is um, identical. Identical in the sense that it has the same distribution. So this cares about the solution. We don't care about the actual value. Does, does that make sense? The reason why we can do this is exactly because this, this conditional distribution is, is, is um, not functionally dependent on theta. Everyone understands sort of sufficiency. We'll see examples. But how many people have seen sufficiency before? Okay, some people have seen it. So, so not too bad, I guess. Uh, uh, so here's a simple example. We have the coin tossing example Xi of Bernoulli from Theta um, IID. Um, so I'm going to use this notation, uh, capital X for random quantity and little x for uh, realization, deterministic sort of realization. So uh, we want to show but you might have guessed that like the sum um, of um, xi is, is sufficient for estimating theta. I do not need the entire sequence. I just need the, the number of, let's say, one. So the way to do it um, is to write down, uh, like from definition, I have to calculate the conditional distribution of x minus t. So I start by writing the TMS for the last function. So the probability to understand that x is equal to this little x is going to be a PMS. This is our notation. <coughs> um, this is the product that these guys do remember by independence. Uh, and this, if you expand, you get theta as a summation. So this would be equal to uh, theta sum xi and then one minus theta um, n minus sum xi and then sum xi I'm calling P of x. You can see that this is um, a function of my original observation, which is that sequence. So it's a statistic. So that's my PMS. Okay, I've written my PMS in this sort of uh, simple form. So far, so good. Now I'm going to have to calculate it. Let's say um, I want to do the, the usual um, probability 101, let's say. How to do um, probably that x, uh, sorry, probably the, uh, yeah, x equal to x given that t is equal to t. I have to do the joint um, divided by the margin. Okay, so let's now figure out the joint distribution. What is the joint distribution of x and t? Um, this is a little bit tricky because this t. Function depends on x. Okay. And in the discrete case, we can work things out. In the continuous case, things wouldn't be that easy. So this is like T of capital X, right? And then I have this uh, identity here, or like equality here. So what I'm saying is that this is um, exactly equal to this times this indicator function. Okay, maybe you can look at it a little bit. Um, see. How would you justify the set? Is this correct? Yeah. Um, I would avoid P of T given X. Yeah. Uh, so you're saying this is P of, okay. This is this, okay. P of T equal P times X. This is like, um, TFT equal T given X equal. So why is that like the indicator? So this is a zero one you're saying, right? I'm saying that this is either one or zero. I would guess it could be derived as assuming that this is like even. Yeah, so I'm, I'm fixing this little X and this little T, right? This capital T here is the functional form. So. This is saying tf, basically let's say x1 up to xn. This, this takes any sequence to the sum of the sequence. And this is equivalent to saying that this is 
you're right. This is another way of writing it. Um, you can think it that way. Uh, not equal to t. This is sort of that. You're right. Uh, it's also easy to see more directly. The thing is, uh, anyone else wants to? Maybe. Okay. The first. Yeah, why is this thing equal to this thing? Because like p is a function of x, and then we are basically just want to find the subset of the other x. That's why we have a big here on p. Because as long as p is like the big p and big or small p, that, that is still some x. So we are doing the subset here. You're doing subsetting, yes. Uh, but maybe we need some more elaboration. Why like this? Right, but why is it equal to this? Maybe, okay. Josh, yes. Um, so it's just like shorthand for like a piece like definition stuff where if t of x is equal to t, then you're saying you can have a combination of one x and it's t of x doesn't equal to t. So, right. Right, that, that's the easy way of saying it. Anyone else wanted to say anything else? Or I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that basically, if, if you look at this, this is just that. So what it's saying is that if I, if I, if, if you look at this, because I give you the C class and I also give you the sum, either this little x and the sum are consistent. So for example, this could be like, sorry, um, one, one, zero, one. And this is tree. So these are consistent. So if the sum of the sequence is tree, then this is vacuous. So I give it to this guy. Uh, but if, let's say this is four. Uh, I can't have a sequence with like, like that, and the sum is equal to four. In this case, so this would be zero, this would be two. Okay, so there is this, because this is a function that is completely determined by x, then there's a question of consistency between this, the angle like, x and t. So that's like, you can also like um, argue that this is like that, but I guess this this might be simpler. Okay, this is just a short annotation to that, and then uh, how it goes. Like, like, yeah. You can see there's like a trickiness in, in writing it because this event sort of sort of seems like uh, one is a contained in the other. One is one once I determine that say this, this event is completely determined. Okay, then I'm going to plug this in, this guy here, just plug it uh, for this. And I'm doing a little bit of uh, manipulation here as well, because um, I'm sort of doing this, I'm just replacing this T of X with OT. Okay, why is that valid? Plug this into this, but I'm just also going to write. This is low T. Yeah. Because of the naked function? Yeah, because of the indicate function, whenever this is non zero, this relation holds and you just replace it there. Okay. So that's a good little trick. So we are done. So this is the joint distribution. Okay. Round for all possible keys and all possible x. Like, sometimes it's zero because they don't match, or like they're not consistent. Sometimes it's just this guy, but uh, and the case of where this is this guy, I can just also use T here. Uh, okay, that's just from the previous slide. Questions? Um, now, the distribution theory can 
that the recalculate or we can just integrate or just some marginalized basis in there. Right? I can now marginalize this is just goes back to the idea of marginalization. So we can try and figure it out. Here I can marginalize. Uh, and now I have a joint and marginalize T. So well, actually I'm just going to marginalize X. I'm going to marginalize that X because I want the distribution of T. So I sum over all X's, all possible sequences. When I sum over all possible sequences, because this T is fixed, right? So this is equal to sum over x, p theta x equal to x, t equal to t. Summing over all x's, um, I can move this out because this p is fixed. This comes out of the sum I get this image. Okay. Um, if you think a little bit about this image, Turns out that this sum is fixed. Let me choose two. Okay. Anyone wants to argue at this point? It's just a combination of question. Okay. Right. This is saying, great. What was your name again? Raymond. Okay. Uh, we have like n coins, right? n flips. Um, and we're saying the sum is equal to t. So we're just saying out of n coin flips. Uh, how many or how many sequences the sum is equal to t? That's like a common common inquiry question. You pick like uh, I just have to pick the positions of the ones, right? You have n positions. I know that t of them are one. I just know which ones. Uh, I just have to out of this n choose t t locations to put the ones on in, and that's exactly right. Like, Okay, so that's that. Now I divide this guy by this guy, I get my conditional distribution. So, and I do the division. So this, this thing divided by this, um, I get this expression. And the, the theta part you can see cancels out. Um, uh, the part that remains is this. This remains and this indicator. Okay, now you see this this does not depend on theta. Right? The conditional distribution of x and t does not depend on theta, so we have proven our claim. So t is sufficient for this model. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. The question is that doesn't have to always be this difficult. No, the answer is no. <laughs> we'll see in the next slide. I'm just doing it so that you see it once, and it's not easy to do it uh, in general. In this discrete case, you can do this. In general, it's not. This like anticipates my next slide. Oh, I don't have a slide here. Um, I can look at this slide. See if anyone has a question. And you can also like think about what this distribution is and what that distribution is. So one of them should be easy.
So one, yeah. Uh, so basically, we have a uniform distribution over the space of all uh, guest point posts where you have two heads. Yes, exactly. So this is a uniform distribution over all possible sequences where you observe p heads. That's exactly it. What is that one? Binomial, I guess. Right? Yeah. So basically, what we have proven here, because P is um, summation xii from one to i, and xi is our Bernoulli theta. Uh, as a byproduct, we have shown that what is this distribution? The distribution sum of a bunch of Bernoullis, and if you look up, this is one of the binomial distributions. So what we have proven is that. Um, the sum of n um, independent Bernoulli variables uh, as the binomial distribution of parameters in theta, which is a very basic fact, but we also proved it as well. And this part is the part that you can use for simulation. So um, I had the original star sequence, say one, zero. Um, I throw it out. I just keep three here. So that will be my T. Now, later on, someone tells me I, I want the sequence back. And then you go and generate X prime uh, from a binomial, sorry, not binomial, from uniform um, over all sequences uh, that have uh, three ones in the uniform. Then when we take the sequence, you might end up with something like X prime might turn out to be like one, zero, zero. Then how many have six? Right? One. I just want the, the correct number once. You just repeated the sample. Like someone else asked me, you repeat the sample another one from this. Right? So right? you just you know a T, so you're gonna sample from um, basically X prime given T is equivalent to sampling X uniformly from the sequences uh, on uh, or, or sequences of uh, zero one uh, of length and that have T ones in them. So uniform all of that states they just generate basically random Bernoulli's right. Pick one, you can pick this one. You know that it has to be three, and n let's say six. Uh, so I pick this randomly permuted and I give it to whoever asked for simulation. Okay. Yes. Right. So just to clarify, it's a uniform distribution over a finite set, and then each thing in the set has the same chance of being drawn. Yes, exactly. So that's saying. I'm, I'm looking at all the sequences whose sum is equal to p. They're exactly this many, and each one gets the same probability to generate. So it's uniform over this finite discrete set. Okay. So if you understand this, basically you understand like sort of what uh, sufficiency is. Uh, but then, if you want to do homeworks or you really care about sufficiency, you don't want to do this every time, and Realistically, if you want to do a statistic, per se. So you want to have a simple way of figuring out uh, efficiency. And, and this is where um, this factorization theorem, with the Fisher and Neyman, comes in. Okay? It's a very simple way of uh, deducing sufficiency, uh, as you can see. So the formal statement is, assume that this family is um, dominated by a measure mu. This, this has been our underlying assumption. Um, so every one of these distributions have a density p a i of x with respect to mu. And so the statistic p is called sufficient, not called so we define uh, is going to be sufficient this bit here, if and only if uh, there are these functions g theta and h uh, measurable and, and all, such that this density factorizes in this form in this fashion. Uh, for almost every x under mu. This is again the part where densities are not everywhere defined, but it's a mild issue for us. Um, 
So the main point is that I can factorize the density uh, into the product of these two terms. One part depends on theta and the other does not. And the part that depends on theta only depends on data to the P of x. Okay, so there are two factors, one depending on theta and the other is not. And the data, the theta dependent part, parameter dependent part, only depends on data via this P of x. Okay. Uh, so, okay, let's, uh, let's not go back. Uh, for, for the Bernoulli example, let's see how this works. So we ended up showing that this is equal to theta summation xi, one minus theta n minus summation xi, right? You can see that I can write this as g theta of sigma xi, where g theta is, g theta, let's say t is um, theta to the t, this, this is a dummy variable, it doesn't matter what you call it, but if I define g theta to be like that, then I can write my density like that, and then the edge here is one. This is such a, okay, I wrote the density as um, a function of theta times a function of x, and the part that's a function of theta um, only depends on data through this. Okay, that's, that's done, so one line proof. Um, so we are not going to prove the factorization here. It's an if and only if. But if you want, and I'm not going to go, this is a proof in the discrete case. Uh, one side is uh, if I have this, then Px is sufficient. That side is exactly, in the discrete case, is exactly similar to the calculation that we did just now. So you do this calculation of joints. It's, it's going to have this form, and then you plug in this form, and then you replace p of x with t, and then you go through that same exact argument that we did for the Bernoulli case, and you end up with, with something with this conditional weight. The conditional distribution is not dependent on theta. As an exercise, you can go through this. It's exactly the same as the other one. This other part is also maybe that next time we're going to talk about this. It's simple, um, and you can do it in the. I'm going to briefly mention this uh, that if. Um, The, the fact that this holds and t is sufficient is what you usually mean when that's the argument. The fact that if t is uh, sufficient, then this holds. It's like a two line argument here that we we'll talk about next time. But in the general case, the proof is complicated. And there's no nice direct proof that I know of. Uh, let's just accept it, okay? And then we move on to something else or like example. But this simplifies the, the, the calculation of sufficient states. Yes, other power is at 5 30. I can do Zoom, but I'm in the office. I'm in the office, yeah. If, if someone wants, let me know. But the time is in person. I think I've seen it.